Nanita Schleiterstein was one of the most renowned piano makers in Vienna at the turn of the 19th century. She was a successful craftsperson in a male-dominated industry, as well as a pianist, a composer, and an important figure in Viennese musical culture. In addition to her work as a piano maker, Nanetta and her husband and business partner, Andreas, held frequent concerts, and they were close friends with people like Beethoven. There is great research available on Nanetta's company and her instruments. But little has been written about how Nanetta's identity as a 19th century woman influenced the way she presented herself and how she was perceived by others as a piano maker. Despite being called a notorious lady, eine berüchtige Dame, by one commentator, Nanetta wasn't in fact alone as a working woman in the piano making industry. It was in fact normal for a woman of her, uh, like her from a lower middle class artisan family to work in or even to own a small business. In the piano trade specifically, scholar Jennifer Nix has found women participating in several London businesses during this period, including members of the Broadwood family. What is unusual about Nanetta is her visibility, her success, and the relative abundance of sources about her life and experiences as a woman piano maker. I'm going to introduce Nanetta to you by talking about different aspects of her life and work in three parts. Part one is about her training and identity as a pianist piano maker. Part two is about her workshop and the construction of her instruments. Part three is about how Nanita and her forte pianos were received by the world. Each section incorporates pieces of music from 19th century Vienna performed on forte piano by the wonderful Gilly Loftus. Nanita was born Anna Maria Stein on the 2nd of January in 1769, 251 years ago. As a child, she learned how to both play and how to make pianos from her father, the famous maker Johann Andreas Stein. They lived in Augsburg, Germany, but Stein took the young Nanetta on tours around Europe as a prodigy, uh, where she performed on his newly invented instruments. According to Nanetta's obituary from 1833, Stein trained her to freely and easily point out the advantages of her father's latest work before the highest aristocracy. So at the age of eight, Nanita's job was to display her own piano skills and the capabilities of her father's instruments. At 10, Stein began to teach her to make various parts of the mechanism and trained her to construct the keyboard, to tune and eventually in the utter perfection of his pianos. At the same time, lessons in singing and piano making were carried out with uninterrupted zeal so that her playing grew more and more accomplished and through the most thorough knowledge of the mechanism, she learned to unlock the most beautiful tone. What this source suggests is that piano making and playing went hand in hand for Nanetta from childhood. Learning how to make a piano influenced how she played one. Stein died in 1792, leaving the 23-year-old Nanetta to take over the family business. Over the next two years, she obtained an imperial license to make and sell instruments and moved to Vienna with her family and new husband, the pianist, composer and teacher Andreas Streicher. Her younger brother, Mateos, worked with her at the firm, but they parted ways in 1802. Her business was then officially named Nanetta Streicher Neistein. She used a number of different names on her pianos. Um, and she was the sole owner and license holder until her death in 1833. Once Nanetta was trading under her own name, her skills as a pianist formed an important part of her identity and her public image as a woman piano maker. In a pamphlet, about piano playing and maintenance from 1801, her husband Andreas writes, Nanetta Stein instruments are made 
especially in regard to the keyboard and tone, by hands that are themselves highly trained in keyboard playing, and for that reason alone are able to prepare for the musician all he needs in order to achieve good performance on the forte piano. Uh, this pamphlet here was given to Nanetta's customers along with their instruments, indicating that it had her approval. We can therefore read the pamphlet and the connection it makes between piano making and piano playing as an expression of the image that Nanetta herself wanted to project. Nanetta's level of pianistic skill was unusual for a piano maker. Emphasising her piano skills is therefore a canny point of difference for her business at this time. But I think it also serves a rhetorical purpose in Andreas's pamphlet. It justifies and reconciles Nanetta's gender with her masculine profession. In 19th century Vienna, um, piano making was an industry dominated by men, but piano playing was strongly associated with women. By describing her experience as a player, Andreas offers the reader a familiar image of an excellent woman pianist. This familiar image helps make the idea of a woman piano maker more legible to people who may not have come across one before. Yet another way we can see the intertwined nature of um, piano playing and piano making for Nanetta is in one of her compositions. She composed four pieces in her lifetime, including a pair of marches for solo piano that was also arranged for woodwind. Um, you see the title page here, published in 1817. In the space of just two short movements, Nanetta explores a surprising variety of articulations and effects. Dynamics range from pianissimo to fortissimo. There are crescendos, diminuendos, and sforzando accents, as well as a mix of staccato and legato passages. The second march covers a range of five octaves, from almost the lowest note to nearly the highest note available on this forte piano. And there is also a mysterious tremolo effect in the trio. Listen out for these features as we hear Gilly play Nanetta's Der Mart Marsch.
almost experimental variety of musical effects. Sounds like Nanetta the piano maker merging with Nanetta the pianist and the composer. We hear her playing with sound and the capabilities of her instrument through her choice of dynamics, range, articulation of notes, and moments that call for the damper and moderator levers or pedals. More on this later. By composing and publishing these marches, Nanetta was displaying her own musicality to the world. But she may also have been exploring yet another method of showing off her instruments to their best advantage, a lesson she learned as a child when she demonstrated her father's instruments. Once Nanetta established her workshop in Vienna, what did she do there and how did she make her instruments? As the master craftsperson, Nanetta managed a team of about 17 journeymen who prepared uh, wood, built and decorated cases, made the mechanisms, among other tasks. According to scholar Michael Latcham, she likely looked after the final phases of the process, such as tuning and regulating the piano. In a profile of Nanetta by her business uh, contact Georg Griesinger from 1802, he writes that she herself alone undertakes the more delicate work in the forte pianos made under her supervision, which actually gives the instrument its soul and substance, its Geist und Gehalt. The phrase delicate work uh, makes Nanita's task sound appropriately feminine, but it also highlights her skilled position at the top of the workshop system. What makes Nanetta's forte pianos, or Hammerflügel, as they were known in German, different from modern grand pianos, like the one lurking in the corner over there? Well, they're generally smaller, quieter, and have a different timbre, or sound quality. But they can also make a wider variety of sounds. And this was something her listeners really valued. The mechanism or action inside her forte pianos is also quite different to modern pianos. Uh, Gilly is disassembling the instrument now. Until about 1805, Nanita used what is called the German Prell, or flip action, invented by her father around 1769. Nanita's action also had some differences to instruments by other piano makers of the time. Her competitor, Anton Walter, developed the Viennese Prell action, of which we have an example on stage today. So this is a copy of a five octave Volta Forte piano from 1795, 1795, made by Chris Mayner. To understand how this action works, we're going to look inside it and compare it to drawings of Nita's instruments from that handy pamphlet by Andreas, which is both a user manual and a treatise on piano playing. Figure six at the bottom of this diagram illustrates the action using a sideways version of an individual key, uh, similar to the one Gilly is showing you now. At the far left, we have the ebony key plate. Uh, which is what you see when you sit down to play. And the mechanism is tucked inside the case. We have the hammer with a head and beak resting on a wooden capsule. The Volta, by contrast, has one of metal. The hammer beak tucks under a vertical escapement hopper, and suspended above it all is the string. So Gilly is bringing a key around now for you to have a look at. And if you look at the screen, you can also see it up close, and you can see the process in motion. So the key begins in neutral, you press the plate down. The far end pushes the capsule and the hammer up. The beak catches on the escapement hopper just there. And it flings the hammer head up into the string. The hammer hits the string, ta-da, making it vibrate and produce a note. You let go of the key and the hammer falls back into its original position. So let's see this one more time. There we are. This process happens uh, very quickly in real time. Mm 
<laughs> you can see that the hammers bounce really freely at the moment, and this was the case in Nanetta's German action. The Volta Viennese action, however, includes an extra component, the back check. So that's this, this piece of wood here with felt on it. This nestles against the hammers to make sure that they don't rebound when the keys are struck forcefully. So that's a key without the back check, and, um, and this is what it looks like when the back check has been replaced. It snaps back into position much more quickly. What the back check means is that a pianist can play more boisterously on a volta than on one of Nanetta's instruments. So remember this idea for later. One last feature to mention as Gilly puts the piano back together. Uh, when um, she goes to, you might have seen her feet moving up and down during the first piece. So what Gilly was doing there is she was pressing a lever with her knee. This changes the timbre, the sound quality. On later pianos, these levers um, are operated by pedals. One lever lifts the damper rail, which lets the strings ring out for longer than they otherwise would. The other lever lowers the moderator, which creates a muted sound. Streicher forte pianos didn't actually include a moderator until about 1807, uh, just in time for Nanetta to use it in her 1817 marches. So don't worry, that's historically appropriate. So how did a 19th century pianist like Nanita's customers, and indeed herself, use this technology to produce a beautiful sound? To find out, we're going to hear performance instructions from Andreas's pamphlet in tandem with variations from his piano study, Exercice de Monsieur Streicher, as well as passages from Nanetta's marches again. Watch Gilly's hands during this section to get an idea of appropriate technique. So Andreas invites us to imagine a true musician who is just ready to play the forte piano in public or in a gathering of people. Uh, note here that I've changed the pronouns. The posture of the arms and the hands and even the motion of the fingers are extremely calm during continuous playing. Under her hands, the keyboard is like a soft, pliable mass out of which she can produce whatever tones she wishes. listen to her slurred notes. How beautifully they are joined together, and yet how correctly they are all separated. No finger is raised before the next one takes its place. No finger lingers on the key when the next note has already been played. Her fast staccato, how light, how calm her hand, and yet how round the tone, no matter how short it might be. In Fortissimo, by raising the dampers, she tricks us into believing we are hearing an organ or the fullness of an entire orchestra. Now in pianissimo, through the same means, she conveys the most gentle tone of the harmonica. When we hear these company approved techniques alongside Andreas's exercises, we gain important information about how he, and likely Nanetta, believed Streicher pianos should be played. 
The pamphlet and exercises are both how-to guides and aesthetic statements about how to draw an ideal sound out of Nanetta's forte pianos, according to her staunchest supporter in both life and work. How were Nanetta and her forte pianos received once they left the workshop? What did her contemporaries say, and who uh, did her forte pianos appeal to? One view comes from Johann Ferdinand von Schoenfeld. In his 1796 guidebook to Viennese musical life, Schoenfeld compares Nanetta's forte pianos with Walter's. Walter's pianos have a full bell-like sound, a clear articulation, and a strong full bass. Initially, the sound is somewhat dull, but when one has played for some time, it becomes very clear, especially in the treble. Very much playing quickly makes the sound harsh and like iron, but this can be remedied by re-leathering the hammers. A DOA fix. In contrast, Schoenfeld praises Nanetta. The third great Meister, or rather Meisterin, is Madame Streicherin. When she once becomes known, she will acquire one of the greatest names amongst us. Her instruments do not have the power of Walter's, but they cannot be equaled for the balance of their sound, their purity, airiness, grace, and gentleness. The sound is not offensive, but melting. The touch requires a light hand, elastic finger pressure, and a feeling heart. Schoenfeld matches these instrument descriptions to two types of Viennese, Viennese pianists. Walter pianists play with a strong sound, extremely fast, study the most difficult runs and the fastest octaves. This requires authority and strength of nerve. To apply these, one is not capable of maintaining a certain restraint and so requires a forte piano that does not break down under such trials. Streicher pianists, however, seek nourishment for the soul and love playing that is not only clear, but also soft and melting. The way that Schoenfeld describes each piano maker aligns them not just with different playing styles, but also different repertoires and genders. Music sociologist Tia Denora has argued that the light and gentle playing style linked to Nanetta's instruments and Andreas's ideal technique was increasingly associated with women performers. Denora contrasts this feminized style with a more physically boisterous one linked to male composer performers like Beethoven. This leads back to a key technical difference between the German and Viennese actions, the back check. Walter's back check stops the hammers rebounding and allows for a heavier playing style. While no back check in Nanetta's instruments requires her players to use a calmer technique. So who were some of these women pianists using Nanetta's instruments? A diary entry from one Count Stolberg Wernigerode in 1814 can help us. At 11 o'clock, I went to a musical academy at Herr Streicher's, a very respected piano teacher whose wife, Nanetta Streicher, is the head of a famous instrument factory. The hall was decorated with the busts of famous pianists, Archduke Rudolf, Prince Louis Ferdinand of Prussia, Fräulein Kurzberg, Kurzberg, mm, mm, have to practice that one, Frau von Pereira, Fräulein Hahn, Countess Mejan de Spielmann, ne Spielmann, Nanetta Streicher, etc. Also, Haydn and Beethoven. First, Nanetta Streicher and Madame Stein, her sister-in-law, played a double sonata for two forte pianos. The busts that presided over the Streicher concert hall uh, create a canon of Vienna's best-known pianists, and they also represent the social spread of Nanetta's customers. Over half these pianists are women from the wealthy middle and upper classes, like Henriette von Pereira. They all also studied with Andreas. All of these women pianists here studied with Andreas. 
What I find significant about this scene is that Nanita has included herself in the canon. So her bust is on the wall too. <laughs> um, and she, she inserts herself into this canon also through her performance that uses two of her own pianos at the same time, quite a, quite a display, and the concert's very location in her workshop complex. She is once again presenting herself, um, she's once again presenting a multifaceted self-image as a pianist piano maker who excels at both art forms. So Beethoven and Haydn are also inc included in this pianist canon right at the end. Uh, but it's Haydn's works that align more closely with Schoenfeld's description of Streicher instruments and their ideal players at this time. Haydn composed and dedicated many piano compositions to women, including the Sonata in G Major, written for Princess Marie Esterhazy in 1784. The presto of the G Major Sonata is a lively and varied display that nevertheless requires the calm hand of Andreas's pamphlet. It is in repertoire like this sonata that Nanetta's forte pianos sing, and it was composed for the kind of woman player this pianist piano maker envisaged for her instruments.
performances. Um, the quote you read from Schinfeld describing the qualities of the different instruments, the gendered resonance of those descriptions really cried out to me. I'm just curious, is there corroborating evidence that uh, male players would prefer the Walter? Um, I, I would imagine most households would likely have had one and only one instrument, so mm -hmm. is it the case that in some households it was more female members who mm -hmm. used them? I'm just curious what uh, corroborating information there might be. So I don't have any data on you know, the, the gender split for either of these companies. Um, and in fact, Latcham thinks that the difference Schoenfeld draws between the two instruments is maybe not actually held out by the instruments themselves. So I think what I would emphasize here is that there is a perception that they appeal to different performers. Um, and I'll let you know if I find out that there, there is a, a real gender split and the customer bases for those those um, two companies, I am really interested in looking at Nanetta's customers for whom I can get information. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for the very interesting presentation, as was the previous one. Uh, I was just curious to know what was the civic address of the workshop or the Arrondissement de Cartier. Mm. Where was it located? It was in the Landstrasse district. Landstrasse. Um, Landstrasse. So it's just outside the old city walls of Vienna. Um, and there were, I think, three or four addresses for the workshop during Nanetta's lifetime, but they were mostly on the Ungargasse. Um, and something I find interesting is that the workshop was. So there was the workshop, there was also the concert hall, but the family also lived above the workshop. So there's this, this kind of blending of family life and work life in both the physical spaces and the relationship between Nanetta and Andreas, which I find quite fascinating. But yes, in short, the Landstrasse district of Vienna. L-A-N-D-S-T-R-A Schaffs S-E or two S's, E. Yeah. Um, I, can, if, I can take your email and, and send, you, send you a source if you like. Yeah, I, I do have them written down. Great, great. Oh, I see one up the back. I want to know more about these busts. About the busts? Yeah. It's actually fascinating. <laughs> so so um, Nanetta was really interested in phrenology, which is um, a pseudoscience, later became quite a problematically racist pseudoscience. But she was really interested in this practice of measuring skulls to find out about people's personalities and traits. She translated um, Franz Gall's book on phrenology into French from German. And these busts, are, I think some of them are actually busts that were created for phren phrenological purposes. So um, you might be aware that a life cast of Beethoven was taken at one point. And the purpose of that was to see what was going on with his head and, and think about genius. Um, and uh, it's that kind of bust that is displayed in the concert hall. So it's, it's a fascinating backstory. There's also one of Nanetta, which is still surviving, I think. It's in the Gaal collection of um, busts in another museum somewhere, which I can't remember right now. Um, yeah, but there's this really interesting relationship between Nanetta's work as a piano maker and this scientific interest, even if it's ultimately kind of bogus. So thank you for asking me about yeah. the busts. <laughs> I was just wondering if there's also some sort of social relationship with busts, like do mm. people give each other busts? Oh, <laughs> that I'm so. not sure about, um, but you know what, I'm going to look into it. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. <laughs> Thank you for that. 
I'm just curious about the pianos. Do you know if any of these are surviving? Yes. And if so, where? And have you ever had a chance to play with one? Yeah, well, lots. I've never had a chance to play with one, but Gilly actually owns a, a kind of hybrid copy of a Streicher. Um, I think, I'm afraid I can't give you an exact figure, but I think there are about 20 instruments still surviving in various states of repair from across across Nanessa's whole career. Um, and they change quite significantly, both in terms of their technology and their size, their sheer size, um, by the time of her death in 1833. Um, but Gilly, if you want to come up here near my microphone, um, if you want, want to tell us a little bit about what it's like to, ah, that's better. <laughs> a little bit about what, it, what it's like to play a Streicher-like instrument in, in comparison to the Volta, perhaps. Yeah, we talk, Hester and I talked about this uh, in one of our kind of sessions. Um, it's going to be a, a cliche kind of thing. Each <laughs> piano is different, you know, mm. so of course, uh, for each of these builders, there are certain, you know, elements of their craft that persisted over, over their lifetime and, and their output. Um, but they were also so um, creative themselves and always innovating and always changing. So mm. instruments themselves within one oeuvre of one workshop can change quite dramatically, as Hester was saying. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, they were making lots of different kinds of pianos at the same time. So this, this mechanism, the um, Viennese action, Nanetta um, eventually takes on. So that, that comes into her workshop. And then they develop what's called a down-striking action. So the hammer falls down instead of falling out. But they continue to make the older style of pianos. So they're catering to quite a wide um, range of customers with different aesthetic preferences. And actually, um, I guess an important un unsung hero of, of that is the square piano. Mm, mm -hmm. um, where it's somewhat misleading when we see a piano of this shape and we're used to seeing either these or uprights. Mm. Um, but to go back to the question from earlier, um, yeah, exactly. So as their name suggests, square instruments, uh, domestic mm. house pianos. Mm. Um, and for many, of, for many firms, that was the main uh, bulk of their output. Uh, to make a grand like this was, well, grand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You needed space and, and a need for it. Um, but the Streichers yes. seem to have only made grands. So, Which is, I mean, well, yeah, it's very unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and but also I think um, said something about Vienna because mm -hmm. grands were much more common in Vienna than say England, which is where squares were the the order of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Gilly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Gilly. Thank you for ferrying the mics around. Yeah.